Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Trident Talks. I'm Josh, the Recruitment Director here at Trident and I'm very pleased to say today we're joined by uh, someone I know quite well, Ian Thorson trump the CISO at Cyjax. Ian, welcome and thank you for joining us. How are you? I'm great, Josh. Thank you so much, man. Um, it's always great to, to be here with Trident. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining us. So, Ian, for, for the viewers and the listeners, please let us know who are you? What's your background? How did you, I suppose, how did you make your way to the UK, more importantly? <laughs> and why did you stay? Yeah, um, it's great stuff. Um, I'll go through the real quick. Um, I've done, you know, a bunch of military service, um, worked for the RCMP uh, for a year um, in uh, intelligence. And so, you know, totally thought that um, cyber threat intelligence was where I belong. It's been a long journey uh, to that. Um, started off uh, growing up in Canada, moving over to Scotland to join a startup. That startup got acquired. Um, then did a bunch of work for HSBC, Labrooks Coral Group, uh, and Trust Financial Group, all either setting up or um, developing uh, cyber threat intelligence programs for those organizations. And then, you know, finally found my, uh, my dream job in a sense of working for a cyber threat intelligence vendor. So nice. Awesome. So as I mentioned, so you're the CISO at Cyjax, obviously the, yeah. the threat intelligence vendor you, met, you mentioned there. What's your role there and, and who are they? For those who don't know Cyjax, what kind of digital intelligence vendor, right? So what kind of services do you offer? What kind of clients do you service, I suppose? Tell us more about that. Yeah, well, it's exclusively an, 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 an enterprise offering. Um, you know, we've got a, a solid book of business with UK companies and international. I think we're mostly known for our work with the uh, with all of the uh, police and law enforcement agencies yeah. that are out there. Um, I would say that our strengths really lie in um, our human analysis of cyber activity um, and also, of course, uh, de uh, digging deep into the dark web and uh, other areas that I would say the other sphere to tread. Um, it's interesting. It's a dynamic and changing environment as CISO and because of my background. I'm mostly, believe it or not, the voice of reason uh, when it comes to looking at our strategies and, and, and what we need to kind of improve upon in terms of the offering, but also what sets us apart from other organizations. So since my tenure now is about seven months in the role, um, we have made some strategic decisions to, um, to improve um, how we feel intelligence uh, should be delivered to organizations and how programs can be established Published for uh, very low cost and what those benefits of course are uh, to having an intelligence program nice the main reason I'll admit I want to get you on the show uh, today is to talk about the evolution of ransomware right how companies are now and not just companies but vendors consultancies and the individual analysts are kind of trying to combat ransomware attacks yours here at the forefront and have been for many years and I'm guessing there's no better person to ask it yourself about how's that changed and what especially i'm guessing it's been almost fast track because of covid as well because of the pandemic can you just kind of talk us through different stages and where you think we're at now in terms of how we combat ransomware attacks yeah well i mean cyber attacks in general with ransomware is now the most likely outcome of yeah. that attack you know unless you fall into certain risk categories that I, I can talk a little bit about but let's go back to 2015 be where yeah. ransomware really became prominent as as an attack uh, opportunity before that it was like an annoying pop-up saying that your computer was infected and we saw uh, those type of attacks widespread from 2010 to about 2015 when the first strains of crypto locker started to arrive and so you know what we quickly learned at that point is that um, our security controls in a lot of cases and a lot of businesses were not adequate um, for the threat but um, we had um, really neglected uh, using the human firewall effectively in our organizations to prevent that, that type of attack. So in 2015, when I was with the startup that went on to become acquired by SolarWinds, um, we re established quickly the lead for something that could be deployed quickly to an endpoint to provide that base level of cybersecurity essentials, uh, UK cybersecurity essentials controls, but at the same time, we, went, we got very public and started creating a lot of content around 
uh, of the awareness of the threat, especially within the managed service provider community, um, awareness of the threat from the perspective of how devastating a ransomware attack can be on a business, especially a small, medium business. And then also, the um, I would say the shared responsibility of the vendor community, the uh, the practitioners, be it in-house IT or be it managed service provider, and then also of course the users that um, are interacting with the internet on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. So really, my my belief is that you know you're exposed to cyber threat, potentially ransomware at home while you're traveling and at work. And, and what I found sort of the major deficiency in a lot of thinking was that we would build these little castles of corporations and then um, we would uh, sort of neglect the traveling and the work and the home aspect of our users. Now with COVID, and you're 100% right, Josh, on, on what happened, uh, you know, we, the perimeter completely gone now. Uh, most companies are putting the equivalent of daycare centers onto their corporate network with an employee or employees working remotely. So that the threat of uh, ransomware now is um, significantly, I would say, elevated because the attack surface that the bad guys have to work with now includes a whole bunch of unmanaged networks that are connected to the corporate network. And, and I think that was sort of the huge game-changing um, situation that we had in the pandemic world. And so finally, what we've seen now um, in terms of the threat actors like Maze and Saboki and a number of others, so they've really amped up the game. They've done it for a couple of reasons. The first reason is, is that um, not only ransomware or encrypting your files, but threatening to publicly disclose that information in order to get you to pay the ransom that they're asking for. And by the way, the ransom is no longer, you know, 200 US dollars and a gift card. It runs into the tens of thousands of dollars or pounds. So, so there's that aspect to where the threat now has evolved into ransomware plus uh, blackmail. Now, you know, between you and me and I think it's really important <clears throat> to suggest that we don't have any scientific evidence, but I almost feel that the uh, cyber insurance industry has, um, has been responsible for the huge increase in the amount of money that the cyber criminals can ask for. Because depending on how the cyber insurance policy is written and what the caveats are, um, many businesses are not adequately protecting themselves as illustrated by these ransomware campaigns. And they're relying on their cyber insurance policy to pay the ransom for them to get their fines back. Now we don't have uh, any um, detail on how many folks had cyber insurance and how many folks have paid a claim via funds mm -hmm. made available from that cyber insurance. But something tells me that if there's big sums of money involved, uh, many small, medium, and even large businesses um, are paying out, in some cases, millions in, in ransom. Uh, that money is is got to come from somewhere, right? Very, very good point. And I think also, well, if a company is insured from a cyber attack, they kind of, they become, do they become more relaxed internally because they're like, let's not spend X amount of money on a new vendor or a new technology because we're covered right um but that doesn't stop them from being impacted by like the pr of it because like you said the ransomware uh, sorry the threat actor will still post online um to kind of almost force the the, the company's hand to pay the ransom right um so yeah it's a very good point i didn't think of it like that where the insurers have almost created a new market for, for the threat actors right and it's a highly lucrative market and it can be worth millions um to, to, per, per ransomware um, also, what we're seeing, and I have, I've had a lot of conversations around this, ransomware developers, are their intent and capability has increased. So, for example, we are seeing now that attached to a piece of ransomware, they're able to now, even when they do, the company, organization pays the, the ransom, that the ransomware can still delete the encrypted files because they can add in, add in uh, code into the, into the, the, the ransomware um, to, to do it remotely. So it's like, you, the insurer could pay out, it could be hundreds of thousands, and then the threat actor goes, yeah, press a button, delete, we're going to delete all your encrypted files anyway. Thanks for paying.
we'll see you next week. Um, so yeah, it's interesting how, and like you said, how now the human element or the human firewall there's no longer, there's suddenly the end point that we're sat on now, I'm here at home, we're sat on now, there's not a big firewall in place, like an, uh, an enterprise firewall, and there's not also people around you saying, hey, don't click on that link, or I can't go and grab the IT guy to say, hey, do you think this is malicious, or you're now just kind of a, a little bit more relaxed as well, right, I'm in my, in my home. Um, so, yeah, very, very good points, interesting. So, to a look forward then, in terms of threat intelligence as an industry, maybe even more yeah. specifically as vendors, what does that look like? Because your role now, right? And I think there's no better people than intelligence professionals to try and, like you said, pull the strings together from a business perspective and a technology perspective to look forward to the future. What does that look like, particularly maybe for Sijax or just vendors in general? We spoke about America prior to coming on. What's the future look like? So I think I, I think it's interesting. There's a couple of different, um, I would say, trends that I'm seeing. It the first really big trend is the big the bringing together, if you will, of the geopolitical realities and the cyber threat realities, and seeing the two intertwined. You know, we know that every time um, Iran uh, or North Korea are have their sanctions increased, we know that mm -hmm. there's a response. Uh, from cyber operations to that. Uh, we know, we could predict that as soon as large American corporations um, and UK corporations started looking at vaccination for COVID-19, we know that Chinese and other operators would be very interested in that information as everybody races mm. to, uh, to discover a vaccine. So we know that um, the geopolitical activity that goes on in the world has, um, has distinct uh, cyber characteristics. So I think that's the first piece of it. So if your business is geographically distributed across the world, or if you are located in a particular area, but you have supply chain partners in other areas of the world, gaining that situational awareness on what the geopolitical realities are and, you know, and, and what impacts that have potentially on your cyber uh, threat uh, either increased threat or decreased threat uh, become really important to that business for making, I would say, those tactical day-to-day -day decisions. Now, strategic intelligence on what is the market doing, what are my competitors doing, uh, what is being said about me on social media, sock mint, as we like to call it, um, that is another uh, now a huge factor. And if we can say that geopolitical and cyber lean towards sort of physical security awareness, um, then we can easily see that the social media or sock mint leans towards the sales, marketing and business reputation. So what I see is that intelligence um, programs within businesses and analysis and intelligence vendors like ourselves have to go beyond the SOC. We really have to start moving into the business to help them making executive and strategic decisions around investment, around closures, around protecting their people from a physical threat, especially you know, in the case of business going on in Hong Kong right now. A great, a great example of how cyber activity and uh, physical um, activity as the clampdown continues in Hong Kong all inform the health and safety of your employees. And I think then finally, there is this opportunity for um, cyber threat to be used as um, a storytelling mechanism for um, IT security, for IT to the executives about the value that those security controls and those audit controls and those risk controls have for the organization. And, you know, I like to talk about um, cyber threat intelligence analysts as being the people that can understand the nuances of business and can understand cultural dynamics, whereas IT tends to th see things as black and white, on or off, and they only have these two states where in a lot of cases, business has got a lot more nuance to it. And understanding that, you know, the sales cycle in one country is completely different than the sales process in a different country becomes really important so that you can put the right place and the right resources uh, behind your own organization. So I see them uh, being forward-looking in terms of attacks, but also internally looking about how we can better help 
uh, manage the resources that that are that that organization has. And uh, just a final question, I ask all of my guests this, and I didn't actually tell you this before you come on, should I? My final question is not. Don't worry, it's not a, a curveball. Ian, if you weren't in cybersecurity, I think I know the answer to this. What do you think you would do? And I think you'd be a music producer or a rock star. But am I right? I don't know what rock star. But Absolutely. For sure, right? Yeah, I mean, as I sort of look towards the end of my 20, 25 years in cybersecurity and, 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 and threat intelligence, I'm looking forward to uh, basically going back to my roots. And what people may not know about me is that before I, got, I ended up joining the Army, um, I was a rock and roll roadie and I worked with bands like Nazareth and Concrete Blonde. And uh, I'd love to get back into producing music um, and, you know, I'd love to be an international um, hip hop and EDM uh, producer. So um, that'll be the next stage of my career for sure. Yeah, watch out. Absolutely. David Guetta and uh, Timberland, <laughs> watch out. <laughs> um, Ian, it's been epic having you on. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I know the viewers would have loved this episode. So thank you. My pleasure, Josh.